Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Death by a Thousand Commits. My name is Kyle D'Olivera. I am based out of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Um, if you've never been to the West Coast, specifically the West Coast of Canada, it's beautiful. I highly recommend it. Um, I am a staff software developer at Clio. And Clio is a 12-year-old SaaS-based company focused on making legal software to transform the practice of law for good. And I work for them on their backend infrastructure team, and my team focuses on three major things. We focus on how we can make the code bases scalable, both in terms of the data set size and the code size. We make the code bases approachable, so how long does it take for a new developer to onboard into a specific area? or to just onboard into the code base in general. And three, we focus on the overall developer experience with working in all of our code bases. And this means I'm thinking a lot about technical debt. Over the seven years that I've been with Clio, I have seen a lot of it go through. From various stages of how the company handling it, from ignoring it entirely, to setting aside a little bit of time to fixing it, but still letting it accumulate, to getting to a point where we are striving to pay down all technical debt to improve all future development. I don't know how many times I've looked at pieces of code and thought, who wrote this, only to find out it was actually me from several years earlier. Technical debt is a really interesting concept. It often doesn't really change the behavior of the system. So the business might not see it. But what it does do is it slows down development or potentially impacts the performance of the site. And that is something that the business does see. And as developers, we need to advocate to the company about the risks and rewards of leaving technical debt in or paying it down and pushing forward. Now, the slowness can come from developers that are getting pulled off projects that are needing to address emergencies uh, or maybe it's just that things are just overall slower and they need to spend more time in maintenance and doing optimizations. Or possibly it's because of legacy code that it kind of exists that developers need to read, understand, and work with that just slow them down. So back in 2009, Martin Fowler wrote up a post about how technical debt was introduced into code bases and had these technical debt quadrants. On one axis, we have deliberate and inadvertent actions. On the other axis, we have reckless and prudent. When we're in the reckless inadvertent area, this is often when people don't actually know any better and there's a hard deadline or things that are pushing people to move faster. At Clio, we've had these instances where we've deployed code in our API, which we thought was the right decision at the time and years later, it is still biting us and we just didn't know and we can't get rid of it. When you kind of move into the reckless deliberate, this is when people know better, but still push forward anyways. They cut corners and they don't worry about the technical debt that they are introducing. Sometimes it might be okay to be in this cat quadrant. When speed is absolutely crucial, when first to market is the most important thing, this might be okay. Or when you're working on a prototype and you just need to understand the system. But ideally, we're moving more into the prudent, deliberate side of things, where you know what the consequences that you are delivering of the technical debt, and you deal with it before there are any major consequences or as the consequences come up. At Clio, we try to be in this quadrant as much as possible, and we try to schedule time to clean up things immediately after projects. We take the view that if we could deliver something a month early, get some user feedback, stabilize things. That's actually a thing that we often want to take and then use that extra month to just clean up. We, the project isn't done yet, but we've got it into the hands of the users early and we're gonna clean up right away. But lastly, you can also have this inadvertent prudent category where you introduce stuff, but you didn't really realize it. But once you do realize it, you use that as a teaching lesson. 
I think it's unreasonable for developers to know all of the ways that technical debt can be introduced and that which ones will slow them down. But as much as we want to be in the top right corner, oftentimes we end up in the bottom right and we use, just use these as learning lessons for the whole company and all of the other developers. Once technical debt is in the code base though, which is inevitable, we need the strategies on how to pay it down. And the most basic ones are just to be reactive, to pay, deal with the consequences as they come up. Um, this could be because the developers didn't know that the technical debt existed in their code base in the first place, or it could be that they knew it was there and they deemed it was an acceptable risk and that's no longer the case. So this could be your database is now slow and servers are unable to serve requests and the business is pushing to have developers fix this as soon as possible. Or it could be that there's now some sort of situation going on that are causing customers to leave. And either way, it's going to now become the highest priority for the developers and distract them from their projects. You could look to be a little bit more proactive and identify problems and try to tackle them before they come emergencies. You could think about what will become a problem and fix it before then. You could think about what could indicate there is a problem and look to monitor it so that you get warning. Or if you know that there are bad patterns that you want to keep out of your code base in general, why don't you try to keep them out from day one rather than trying to fix them as you find them? It is often hard for the business to understand the risks associated with leaving technical debt in place. And as developers, it's our responsibility to advocate for time to fix these. But lastly, we can look to invest in tools. And now, investing in tools might slow you down, but in the long run, it will greatly speed you up. Sometimes the tools have already been built, so all that's required is a little bit of research and maybe setup, but sometimes they are not built and you need to build them yourself. I'd like to focus on four lessons that we've learned at Clio that have helped us mitigate some of the technical debt going forward in our code base. So some of the tactics and tools that I'll talk about today may be directly able to be incorporated into your code bases, but hopefully you're starting to think about how can you tool away some of the technical debt that exists in your projects. So the first lesson I want to talk about is dealing with fixing, why would you want to fix technical debt when you could just find a way to just remove it entirely? So imagine if there's a whole classification of problems that you could just put some time into and then in the future, developers just don't need to think about it anymore. I want to talk about a situation in Clio where we noticed this. There was a point in time when there was a controller endpoint that wasn't being consistently fast. We, all of our local tests, all of our tests on our staging servers felt like it should be one of the fastest things, but it's at, in production, it was one of the slowest. And we wanted to know why. So we started digging into what was going on here, and we found out that the endpoint was making hundreds, if not thousands, of database queries. So it turns out this endpoint had a whole bunch of problems, but they were all N plus one queries. There's the silent performance tax. For those of you who aren't familiar with N plus one queries, it's a super common issue that shows up in Rails and any, or anything that uses a relational database. And what ended up happening is you might first query a collection of objects in the database, for instance, contacts, and then you try to access associations on those contacts. And what ends up happening is you end up making queries individually for each contact. Now, each query has a little bit of overhead and is fairly fast, and in small numbers, it's not really noticeable. But when there are hundreds of them and thousands of them, it can significantly slow you down. But they don't really influence and user behavior, they don't influence the behavior of the system, so they're often easily overlooked. And ideally, what you should be looking at is making two queries, one for the collection of contacts, one for the collection of emails. So let's look at an actual code example of how these would start popping up in your code base over time. Imagine we have a very basic JSON API. So here's a very simple controller, just grab some contacts, renders them as JSON, puts a limit on them so we don't render all of our contacts. And if you used active model serializers, you could have a serializer that looked like this, 
We just will start with ID and name. And now we have a kind of functioning JSON API where we get some sort of response back of all of our contact IDs and names. Great. So imagine the future. Customers are requesting that this API would be really good if it also returned the emails of the contacts. Well, if the model has the associations already set up, adding it to the API is really easy. You just add one line. Cool. We can write this out, feel like we're very productive, get this out the door very quickly, and feel like we are moving very fast. But did you notice the n plus one query that I just introduced? So I'm talking about it, so hopefully it's front of mind. But if you were reviewing this piece of code in a standalone pull request, would you have noticed it? Maybe? Maybe not. It requires human efforts, and human makes mistakes. And there's just a little bit of technical debt here. But if this got out into production, would it be the end of the world? Probably not. You probably wouldn't even notice it. But as the future of this API goes on, what happens when we have phone numbers? And then we have addresses. And then maybe contacts have emergency contacts, which also have phone numbers and emails and addresses. In the ideal fashion, we're only making a handful of queries for all of this information. But if we weren't paying attention, we're doing this in a naive fashion, we, end up, we could make one query for the contacts and then 200 for the emails and 200 for the phone numbers and 200 for the address and so on. And what could just be a handful of queries in ideal state is actually hundreds or thousands. And this is basically the situation that we ended up at Clio. Now, Rails does offer a way to fix this. We can look for whatever associations are being used and eager load them in our controller. Now that original n plus one query that I, I introduced is gone. But there's also a couple issues with this approach. It requires a lot of manual human effort. Developers need to understand the usage of the code and the associations that are being used. They need to find the place where the initial query was made so that they can, only, they can add the includes. For small systems, this is really easy. But for complex systems where there's a lot of distance between the, where the data is being used and where the data is being queried, it can be really challenging. In the previous example, the usage was in the serializer, but the query was actually in the controller, so the developers need to understand both. It only fixes one instance of these n plus one queries at a time. So every time we touch these files, we need to potentially be thinking about this. More weight for the reviewers, more work that people need to be thinking about. And what happens when we stop needing the association anymore? Are we, do we just accept that we're doing the preloading if we've already fixed it? Or do we just accept that we'll just leave it as it is? Well, there really has to be a better way. There are tools that kind of exist that can help raise signal whenever an n plus one query is generated, but it still requires manual effort to fix them. So we built a gem that we wanted to call, load the associations just in time, so it ended up being called the JIT preloader. Naming is hard. Um, but this tool we use, and we've had it in our application running in production for the last couple of years, just removes n plus one queries entirely. We drop the gem into our project. We configure it to be globally enabled. And here's what it looked like. So here's a graph of the database time used by that example that I was talking about. We have a data point for every 30 seconds. And we're recording about two to four minutes in a very spiky fashion of database time. So this is accounting for concurrency of multiple requests hitting the endpoint at the same time. It's really spiky, using a lot of database time. And after we release the gem, it started using much less. Stabilized around 30 seconds, about four to eight times better just from removing n plus one queries and adding those two lines to our project. Similarly, here's a graph of the database queries to a specific table in our database. We were making, the scales unfortunately cut off, but the, we were making hundreds and thousands of queries here, and then we deployed the gem, and we stabilized just at a handful. We even took like, some samples of the requests before and after we deployed the gem. We found that like, the 95th percentile of requests we recorded for that sample was twice as better just after deploying the gem, and the 99th percentile was three times as better just after deploying the gem. 
what could have been a huge amount of effort of us going through these controllers, all of our controllers, and removing all of our n plus one queries turned into an investment. We could build the tool, and now we don't need to consider n plus one queries anymore. All of our developers, all of the people who review code can focus more on delivering value to the business. So you could be thinking about what pieces of technical debt could you just automate away entirely? There could be a publicly accessible gem for you that can do it for you, but if not, maybe you can contribute back to the community. In an ideal world, we're sharing all of this knowledge and making it so these pesky issues we complain about are just a thing of the past. The second lesson I want to talk about is clean up code that you don't use. I'm sure many of you have experienced maybe a situation like this where you do a big framework upgrade, like Rails or something, and you start coming across code that breaks with the new version. But you don't know if it's being used or not. So you could, there are tests around it, so the tests are failing. So do you support it or do you not? Likely you probably support it because their tests are failing and that's telling you some sort of signal. But if you deleted it, that would save you a whole bunch of effort if it's not being used. At Clio, we had a situation where we were doing a um, interface upgrade. So short term, we decided that we would duplicate all of our views. One set of views had the new interface, one set of views had the old. And this process for customers only lasted a couple months. But we never ended up cleaning up those duplicated views. And in development mode, you could still see both. So what ended up happening is we ended up supporting both for way too long until someone got fed up, spent the effort, and just started deleting things en masse. But unfortunately, we didn't learn our lesson. A couple of years later, we find out that, oh, hey, we need to do this big upgrade, and we've accumulated a huge amount of rake tasks that are just not being used anymore. And we support them, and we push through this more times than we should. And at some point, we get fed up, we put a little bit of effort in, and we delete everything. Fortunately, we didn't learn our lesson there either. <laughs> Recently, we're starting to switch from Rails-generated HTML templates to a front end that consumes a JSON API. And as we transition off the old endpoints, we really want to clean them up as we go. But it's really easy to not, though. It's hard to know if the code is actually being used in production. There's test cases that will fail if you change this code or remove it. Leaving it alone doesn't cost anything, except for later on when you need to continue supporting it. As your code base evolves, you just hamper yourself in the future. So we wanted to fix this up. So we had some ideas at first, and we started playing with them. The first idea we called the tombstone, which was the simple helper that just made an error and threw it to our bug stag um, instance, which is just our bug tracking service. Um, and this let us just put single lines into random methods or views to just say, hey, this is dead as of this date. Uh, and then we could look for trends. We could say, did this exception occur at all? It's a little bit of a backward signal. If the exception is being thrown, we know it is being used, so we can't delete it. But it was a starting place. We took this, we put in a bunch of controllers and views, and it helped give us a little bit of confidence to remove stuff. But it was still a lot of manual effort. We think anything that requires a lot of manual effort can be automated. So recently, we started building this library. We called it the dead code detector. Um, can't quite tack tackle the rake tax or views from my previous example yet, but it can track a lot of methods. And we've been using it in production for about a month now, so not a huge amount of time. And last week we did some analysis of the reports and started deleting things. The idea behind this tool is we would set it up, leave it around for a reasonable amount of time, get a list of things that haven't been used, and then you can delete them. There's a similar library out there, similar gem called Coverband. Um, it's another useful tool. If this works for your project, great. Um, they have different trade-offs. Coverband gives you finer grain detail and will let you dig into individual lines that have been called or not, whereas the dead code detector will only give you methods. But Coverband's a little bit more volatile as the code changes because it's tracking line numbers and may, does have a larger memory footprint. Either way, you can delete code that you're not being used. So we added the project to our gem and 
basically from a little bit of a month of work, we could just delete about 300 controller actions, 1,000 methods, and we're being really conservative here. Like, I'm only tracking controllers and models and not a lot of our objects. We're going to probably go hard on this over the next few months and just start purging everything that we can pretty easily because we have a tool that tells us what we're allowed to purge. Hopefully, we've learned our lesson this time, and we won't have to maintain this code that we don't support anymore. But I hope now you're thinking about how you can leverage tools to start removing things that are causing you pain that you don't actually need to support anymore. Third lesson. You'll never escape the need to handle emergencies. They will always come up, and they're often very painful, both in terms of interruptions and database time. I want to walk you through the transition point when we really started to learn our lesson here. It was a February many years ago. Everything was going smoothly. And suddenly, we start seeing periodically, periodic spikes in long requests being served by our servers. For users, this means that requests that are normally really quick are taking several seconds, or they're actually being outright rejected, and users are presented with a nice, happy error page. What do we do? Well, at the time, we were using New Relic as an application performance monitor, so we could look at what endpoints are slow. But there's a problem here, too. When the database gets slow, everything gets slow. So New Relic was no use. It was a pile of every endpoint being slow. And the business is putting pressure on us. We need to figure out the cause and fix it. It's the kind of thing where developers aren't going home until they figured it out. We have very little signal and a lot of noise. And our users are getting more and more upset. So we started digging into the database. We started looking at MySQL slow query log, which was just a big dump of information that was kind of overwhelming. We didn't have a lot of people familiar with the logs at the time, and so it was a hard lot to parse all at once. So we started going through it by hand, looking for anything that could be out of the ordinary, looking for anything that was maybe long query or anything that examined a lot of rows. We weren't sure. We would dig through this by hand forever. We would eventually find one. But now what do we do? We know we have a suspect for what's causing these spikes. But we have a query, and that's about it. So we had to lean on the knowledge of the developers in the group. We had to look for the most experienced people with code base, show them the query, and ask, like, hey, does this look familiar? Can you tie this back to anywhere in the code? It required a lot of manual effort and tribal knowledge. But eventually, we would find it, and we'd fix it. And the whole process would take several hours from several developers. And it's happening frequently enough that we're getting pulled off our projects and everything is getting disrupted significantly. It's not fun for everyone. We had pieces of code that were making queries with assumptions that just weren't true anymore. Queries that didn't have limits, queries with lots of joins, because at the time, the data set was small and that was fine. So we started looking into tools of what we could do. Basecamp has this gem, Marginalia. And it attaches query or comments to any query that goes through Active Record, which is really nice. Setting it up is really straightforward. You just add the gem. And what could start off as a very ambiguous query starts giving you a little bit more metadata. We now have a place to start when looking for information. It doesn't give us everything, but now we know that this query init got initiated somewhere in the user's controller in the index action. But maybe you needed more information, and we did it at this point in time as well. Well, in Rails 5.2, there is this active support current attributes. And you can use this to add additional primitives to the SQL query if you would like. So you could add a user ID so you know which user is causing this to understand if there's trends. You could add the request ID so you could go dig into the logs yourself and look up if there's any additional information. Anything that you find might be useful. Setting something up like this is really straightforward. The instructions are in both marginalia and the docs for setting up active support current attributes. You can inherit from it, add a couple attributes, whatever you feel like you'd want. You can set it 
in your controller or jobs or wherever you want to run it. So here's just a before action around in a controller. Marginalia gives you instructions on how to extend it by adding a couple methods to the Marginalia comment module. And then you tell Marginalia to use these. And once again, our query now has more metadata into it. The pain of working from the query back to the source code was a little bit lessened. We didn't need as much tribal knowledge to figure things out, and we had a tool to, to point us in the place where we should start. But maybe we solved the wrong problem here. Rather than trying to go from the logs back to the query, what if we could just have the code tell us what's wrong in the first place? So it turns out Rails is recording some of this information for us. We just need to listen for it. So Active Support Notifications is a nice library that provides information about various events that are happening in your system. In particular, it has the active record.sql event, which is ray or thrown or um, instrumented every time that a query is executed through active record. And with this, you could ask, is the duration greater than some sort of threshold? And if so, do something with it. There's lots of things that active support notification can track that you can subscribe to and add things into your own application. And then if there are things that it doesn't track, these are things that you can add and instrument yourself. Things like how long does a transaction take? Maybe that's something you want to take. How much memory does a controller action take? Maybe that's something you want to track. So for us, we just took a very straightforward approach. We decided we would turn that into an exception with a very clear message and record that in our bug tracking service. So it was bug snag. And what started off being this nebulous problem of someone digging through logs by hand turned into this nice, big, detailed report where we could see exactly the long qu which queries were long, the exact line this came from. We could see trends. When did this start? When did, was this the last instance? How frequently is this happening? We could see releases. Which release introduced this? It would give us a lot of information. But also it would give us proof that when we fix this, these just disappear. And we could actually say, yep, it's gone now. It generated a lot of proactive work for us. But this was all work that was going to save us from having to deal with emergencies in the future. We could go to the business and say, remember that February when the users were really upset and was all caused by these long queries? Well, these queries aren't as bad, but they're getting worse. We need time to fix them. And we can put that in terms that the business understands. And the business is like, OK, yeah, let's tackle a couple of these every week. And we can get into a situation where we don't need to fight fires as much. And when they do come up, we can look for these exceptions and have it tell us what's wrong. So what started off as a super painful process to us is now much less painful. It doesn't magically solve our performance problems, but it does make it so that when performance problems start cropping up, we have much more signal. People can now focus on the actually fixing the problem rather than just finding the problem. We've invested in ourselves, so the bad technical debt is just easier to isolate and tackle. So you could think about when emergency situations crop up in your work, how do you deal with it? What are the things that you just spend a lot of time trying to deal with? How could you add tools to make that easier? Last lesson I want to talk about is keeping the bad patterns out. If you know a bad pattern, you can you automate keeping it out of your code base entirely. You don't have to rely on people to review it. Let's look at an example. Sometimes you might need to write to a temporary file. So here's a, some simple code that writes a temp temporary file, adds its ID and name of all of your contacts in your database, and then closes and removes the file. There's a problem here. And code that Clio doesn't want in its code base. If at any point in time something in the middle of the code breaks, maybe name's actually a method and not a attribute, and it throws an exception at some point in time, we'll just leave the temp, the temp files around. What you really need is to wrap it. We need to say, if we start this block, we need to ensure that we always delete the temp file afterwards. Now, the documentation for temp files is great. It says it's completely unnecessary to delete temporary files, but if you don't, there will be problems. Um, 
And in practice, we notice that there are times when temp files just don't get cleaned up at all. It's somewhat rare, but if you have a lot of things that do work with temp files, we can just fill up a server, and maybe at some point that server runs out of space, and that server's unable to handle things, and you have a partial outage. All because of little bits of technical debt. So prevent this bad technical debt from entering your code base. This is a bit of a fabricated pull request. But if you saw this, what would happen? Well, maybe you have an experienced developer make a comment. You say, hey, this is not great. We'll give you a little motivation of why it might be bad. Here's a blog post about to help you learn more. Maybe here's the documentation. Here's what you could do better. And the person who submitted the code review will read those, understand them, fix it. Everyone's happy. But what would happen if the developer didn't catch that, and we deployed it to production. Would it be the end of the world? Probably not. You might not even notice any problems. But things like this aren't a problem until they are. Maybe next year, it's when the server runs out of space and you have a partial outage. There are tools and tactics to keep bad patterns out of the code base. I'm sure you've heard of this one, RuboCop. It's a static code analysis gem, and it can enforce various rules. You can add these enforcements as part of your CI process, but you can also add this as part of your pre-commit hooks that only look at the files that have changed for much faster feedback. For very simple rules, it can even handle doing autocorrect for you. Now, some of the things in RuboCop are more style-based. You can say, hey, I only prefer single quotes as opposed to double quotes, so RuboCop enforced that. But it can actually enforce more complicated things, like I don't want to ever rescue from exception. Now, if you ever rescue from exception, it will be fine most of the time, except for when it's not. And those are the times that it's going to bite you. You can use RuboCop and things like that to say, like, this is a pattern we just never want in our code base, and it can never get in our code base because we have these checks going. If there are more complicated things, you can write your own cops and supply that back to the community and help prevent other things. Now, sometimes you can't enforce the rule hard, so Shopify had a new tactic they referred to as shitlist-driven development. I love the name. But essentially, it's a way to whitelist some places in your application, saying that this is allowed to do certain behavior, and blacklist everything else. And while you've like, whitelisted a few things, you can continue working to try to fix them without disrupting the development team. So pulled directly from the blog, here's an example of what a shit list might look like, where you say, hey, here we have a job that does some things that we don't like anymore. There are three classes that are allowed to do this, nothing else. And now if any el anything else tries to do this, it will just error with, again, a very clear message. But we can work to remove class A, class B, and class C from doing this behavior. And when we're ready, we can remove this method. But we know that it's not going to get any worth. We stop the bleeding. Also pulled from the blog is something like this. You could have it as part of your test suite. You could say, I only want these three classes to inherit from Redis model. And now these are the only classes that can inherit from it. Anything else, this will fail. This is great. We can start preventing these patterns from getting into our code base early and give clear messages. We talked about the temp file thing. At Clio, we have a, it's part of our CI. If you add temp file.new and violate some of those those conventions, we give you this. It tells you why. It gives you some motivation of why it might be bad. It tells you what it thinks you're doing and what you could potentially do better. If there was a new developer that just copy-pasted some code from Stack Overflow, they would actually get immediate feedback of why it's not great, what they could do, and how they can move forward. And it didn't require any manual effort from a developer. There's lots of ways to kind of do this. And at Clio, we have a bunch of shit lists. We have a bunch of RuboCop rules that we use. And it's a useful tactic for us to just keep all of the bad patterns out. As shown, we have the temp file.new one. But we also do things like global variables. You just don't use global variables. It's now all part of the RuboCop rules. You just can't add it. Randomization in specs. There was a talk earlier about fixing flaky tests. Well, let's just say you can't use randomization in tests. Just no. It's now prevented entirely. We have some more complicated ones around preventing legacy base classes from being inherited from while we clean them up and move everything over to better ones. Whenever you have a bad pattern that has caused you problems, you should think about 
what could we do to prevent these patterns from ever being reintroduced into this code base again and remove the manual effort and make it so that a robot could do it for you? It's important to always be thinking about how we can remove technical debt and acknowledge when we may be intentionally introducing it. The more we focus on utilizing and building tools to make it easier, the more we can focus on delivering value to the businesses we work for. If we focus on building better tools and tactics and sharing them with the community, we all become better. What, can you, what ideas do you have that you could give back to the community? Are there ways that you know that you can eliminate technical debt and now we all don't need to think about it anymore? Rails is amazing because of the community, so let's try to make this the best community possible. Thank you. <laughs>